take is a vibrant art form that is firmly entrenched in Malaysian life. Today, it can be found in both its traditional and contemporary forms, popular amongst locals and tourists alike, and fast gaining popularity in the international arena. But just where did Malaysian batik originate from? Batek is an art form that was nurtured in the center of the royal palaces of the Javanese royal family in Indonesia. Elsewhere in the world, dye-resistant patterns on cloth can be traced as far back as 1,500 years ago to Egypt and the Middle East. More samples were found in Turkey, India, China, Japan, and West Africa. It was believed that these areas developed patterns on cloth independently without the outside influence from traders or cultural exchange. Batek has a murky past, and no one can definitely say where it originated. However, perhaps it can be said that Indonesia, most particularly the island of Java, is the area where Batek had reached the greatest peak of accomplishment in the earlier years. Batek Tulis was one of the favorite pastimes for the Javanese royal families. And all designs they created were exclusively theirs. Not seen nor worn by anyone else. On the island of Bali, it was Princess Mira's drawings that inspired the creation of Bali's batik. By the 19th century, batik had become well ingrained in Javanese culture and lifestyle, thus fast becoming a threat to the royal family's exclusive ownership. It became prevalent throughout all walks of life and has grown to be a world-renowned art form. With regard to the history of batik making in Malaysia, well, uh, if you look at the definition of what batik is in the contemporary context, then uh, the history will be very shallow. But uh, if you are looking at the a wider definition, the scope of definition of batik, then uh, you will go back a long way back, uh, much earlier, somewhere around 1700 or 1800. But somewhere in the 1800s, there is a production already in the, in the East Coast, uh, especially in Kelantan, Palikbang, where the production of batik, uh, it is not the kind of batik making as it is now, but uh, it was defined as batik in those days. After that period, there was another species of batik, which known as uh, batik lokan, where batik lokan looks like batik, as batik in Indonesia, but the process are a little bit different. It's the use of uh, uh, wood where they carve it out into stamps and then they stamp it onto the fabric. Little is known of the origins of batik in Malaysia. It's often said that Javanese batik found its way to the Malay Peninsula via the East Coast back in the 1920s. As Java was once the hub of batik production, many have said that it was Javanese batik that was the original blueprint for Malaysian batik. However, it wasn't until the 1930s that Malaysians began producing batik domestically, and it was recognized 
that Klantan and Tranganu were the primary states where Batik flourished. It was often said that the royal families assisted in the growth of Batik as they encouraged experimentation of techniques in mass production and helped to expand the industry. Somewhere in the early 1900s, uh, there is what we call a, a, an introduction of a new species or new genre of batik again, where the use of uh, stems from, uh, from copper, where they join the copper and then turn it into a stem which they dip it into wax and stamp it onto fabrics. And then from there, it just spread on from stamping into a new journal of pate. Uh, tends to expand and it turns out to be very Malaysian kind of pate. So this is the breakaway from the Indonesian pate. Uh, this new contemporary uh, or a very modern use of, of chemical dyes and paintings is different than the traditional one. Malaysia punya batik lebih modern. Kita punya batik lebih modern dari segi color, dari segi mutu design lebih kepada menepati cita rasa antarabangsa. Batik uh, bermula daripada perkataan batik tu biaklah di, di Malaysia baklah baju tik tu tik. Tik tu bermula daripada yang kita buat menggunakan canting tu, proses yang permulaan menggunakan lilin dan kita titik di atas kain tu dia panggil Batik, lama dia jadi batik, baju batik. Ha, tu kita punya apa, definasi batik. Dan batik ni mesti menggunakan lilin dan teknik rebus. Over the years, this craft has developed its own unique aesthetic pattern and design, peculiar to local Malays. And geometric and plant motifs are frequently adopted in Malaysian batik. When you look back in history, the, the batik making in Malaysia, the design uh, very much evolved from uh, what you see outside, the plants and the animal, then these are transformed into design onto the fabric. But nowadays, there is no rule to design at some of the design that I've seen. But previously, uh, those motifs are actually motifs that derive from surrounding, from environment. Even the plants that they pick as a motif for design symbolize certain certain elements in the community. Dulu Malaysia kop design tu lebih tertumpu ke arah motif-motif persekitaran, juga color kan. Tapi sekarang ni lebih pada global, okay? Yang perkara-perkara uh, muda sekarang batik dia lebih suka pada desain geometrik. Geometrik macam-macam jenis ada. Dia ada yang stripe, ada yang ada flow, uh, ada bunga. Bunga dia macam tak real. Nampak bunga dia macam ada geometrik, uh, lebih ke arah ke arah desain tu. Tapi batik di, desain sentiasa berubah. Kalau ikut segi fashion. Uh, kena semasa desain tu tak tertaluk pada desain tu saja desain tu adalah berubah-ubah Batakers are generally in close contact with nature and it is nature that generally inspires their designs since the arrival of Islam Batakers have been selective of the designs adopted, carefully leaving out animal motifs as Islam prohibits such depictions. Hence, nature becomes the main focus for all patterns. In the past, batik was normally hand-drawn on coarse cotton material. However, now it is more common to find these floral prints on feather-light silk. Batik is also no longer just a sarong, as it now generally refers to batik material sold by the meter to enable individuals to create whatever dress form they desire. The 
it a shirt, traditional attire, or even modern wear. Although the years have seen a transformation of batik, what we have today is mesmerizing to the eyes and softer to the touch. It is well known that a piece of sarum is like a story or a metamorphosis of a human life as the sarum is divided into several parts, namely Barankayin, Kapalakayin, and Pengapit Kapalakayin. The motif of Kapalakayin symbolizes the beginning of human life, where the sperm meets the egg and evolves into the birth of a child, depicted by the design of tendrils. The larger areas, known as barankayin, generally are large motifs, reflect a child already grown up and embarking into the world. Kapalakayin, when placed in front, indicates that the wearer is married. While a single woman, on the other hand, would wear the Pengapit Kapalakayin on the side. However, today, this traditional understanding has ceased to be abided by. Isn't it fascinating that we can witness stages of human life accurately depicted on a piece of sarum? Malaysia's main batik producers are from Kelantan and Tringanu. The Kelantanese have always maintained their role as the custodian of our batik industry. As they have always maintained the aesthetic value of all batiks they produce, either on an exclusive or commercial basis. This is made possible as the Clantonese are loyal in embracing their heritage, whilst making it a good source of income for the batik makers. Preservation of their past heritage is evident in the batik designs and the instruments used. There is no other manner that batik can be produced, be it the old traditional or the new modern way. Visitors can sniff the lingering pungent smell of wax at a Klantan batik maker's backyard as it is turned into a small batik factory, 
usually for the production of batik tulis and chop. There are mainly two types of batik. Either hand-painted or batik tulis as it's widely known or block printed, or batik chop, or batik chop. The difference lies in the production techniques utilized, its motifs and aesthetic expression. They are often cataloged according to the tools employed. The chanting is used for hand painting, whilst the block printing is done by means of a metal block. Alternatively, both these methods can be combined to create a textile of richer color and freer patterns. To appreciate batik, one must witness the entire production process from the beginning right through to the end. Batik is essentially a dye resistance pattern and its creation involves designing, waxing, coloring, and boiling. The number of colors on a piece of batik reveals the number of times the cloth has undergone the above process to achieve its multicolored result. For the purpose of mass production, the block printing method, also known as the silk screening method, is adopted. However, you will notice that it is not as refined as the chanting method common to batik tulis. The stamping is very much focused for the sarong. That is the, 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 the production. But the, the new, new journal of batik using chanting, uh, this is encompasses to all kind of fabrics, either for men's shirt, or for the baju kuro, or whatever. So you can see uh, new design is coming in and emerging from this new technique of uh, making batik, where new dyes are coming in, the reactive dyes, where new, 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 new process and uh, the production is much more uh, easier in terms of uh, making it. In Malaysia, menchanting begins with spreading a defined sized fabric over a metal or wooden frame. Silk is most commonly used in hand painting. The chanting, a small copper container with different sized pipes attached to a handle, made of either wood or bamboo, is filled with two thirds of molten wax. It's then held at an angle against the fabric while tracing the outlines of the pattern. The artist has to be very careful to maintain a smooth flow of wax. The chanting has to be dipped frequently into a wax pot to keep the wax at an optimal temperature. If too hot, it will penetrate the fabric deeply and removing would be difficult. And if too cold, the wax will not stick onto the fabric. In designing patterns, the motifs adopted by the artist are very important as the patterns are relative to visual messages. The next step is to paint or color the parts of the fabric that's not covered in wax. The artist may use a brush or even a sponge if the area to be painted is wide. The color will fasten to the unwaxed area, hence the original color of the fabric will be visible once the wax has been removed. 
warna ni kita ikut kala kalau kain ni kala hijau kita buat daun hijau kita campur dengan hitam sikit nak nak sebenar timbul warna tu warna di kain okey dia timbul lepas tu warna bunga dia ni kita beza antara dua puntu bunga ni hak ni kita warna orange lepas tu bahag yang satu lagi ni kita buat warna ke warna koko hak ni proses ketiga Lepas pada kita buat ni, buat warna apa ni, siap semua 4 meter kain kita warna dalam masa mengambil tempoh, dalam masa 2 je lah selain kain. Ha, lepas tu kita pun angkat kain ni daripada dingin ni, kita jemur. Jemur balik, lepas kering warna, semua kita warna ni kan kering, kita jemur. In Malaysia, Reactive dyes are normally used in batik processing as they have clearer and vibrant colors that fasten easily to cellulose-based fabric or silk cloth. For hand-painted batiks, the different shades of color are created simply by diluting the color with water. Once waxing is completed on one side of the fabric, it's allowed to dry. If the wax has not penetrated the fabric properly, the step is repeated on the other side of the fabric. As the color on the fabric is diluted using water to achieve the desired color, it has to dry before the color can be fixed. The chemical formula of the dye will determine the method of fixing the colors. The color can be fixed by using either sodium silicate or exposing it to the air. Fabrics of different qualities and structures are used in batik making ranging from cotton, viscose, rayon, and silk. Fabrics are pre-washed to remove residue before the waxing and coloring process can take place. For the removal of wax after completion of waxing and coloring, the fabric is soaked in hot water and rinsed several times to remove the excess dye and wax. A litmus test can be done on both sides of the batik to determine if it is hand-painted. The final step is the hanging out of the finished batik fabric to dry before it is ironed to remove creases, following which we will be able to see the end result of the batikers craftsmanship. Kering je mahu kita tetap angkat kain, kita lipat. Lipat kain tu untuk kita hantar ke peringkat seterusnya, ke toke ke untuk jual di kedai. Oh, Alhamdulillah, setakat ini kita maknanya dalam dua minggu sekali gaji sini dah bolehlah tu 200 200 dua minggu tu boleh 200 kadang kita buat lebih boleh lebih dan tiga tu lebih tapi sekali perata kita buat sehari-hari dalam lima lah lima lah sehari empat lah gitulah men okey lah pendapatan tu memang okey lah sekat ni Banyaklah teknik dia. Salah satu dia lukis. Lepas tu dia cok. Sekarang ni kita buat ada setengah tu dibuat dengan guna beruh. Beruh cap. Uh, batik cok dengan batik lukis dia lain. Banyak beza lah. Kain, kain lukis dengan kain cok. The use of janting uh, manage to convince the young batik makers to involve in batik making. 
as compared to the traditional batik. But the stamping, you really need to know the kind of uh, process in terms of colors and stamping it. You need very skill. And uh, it is the secret of the trade where in terms of dyeing. But nowadays, uh, where the use of uh, reactive dyes and the janting, this open up uh, more people to be involved in batik rather than previously it is something like a family kind of business passed from father to son, son to grandson. But nowadays, it is very simple. You can just go to any institution that will introduce you to the technique of batik making, the use of chanting, the use of wax. You can start it. So it is something like very democratic, that democratized the batik making in Malaysia as to compared to Indonesia, which is very still confined to certain ways and uh, rules of batik making. But in Malaysia, it is democratized. Batik chop is produced on a larger scale as compared to batik tulis, as it does not require the refined craftsmanship of menchanti. The patterns are pre-designed on a metal block. In the 1960s, wooden blocks were used, but unlike metal, wooden blocks deteriorate faster from wear and tear. Over time, copper blocks replace the wooden blocks, which were subsequently replaced by the metal blocks currently used nowadays, as they are of a lighter weight. The use of these blocks in the design also self-explains why Batek Sorum makers are mostly men. After all, Repeatedly pressing and lifting the blocks requires a certain amount of strength. In the making of a batek surong, a maximum of two meters of white cloth is required, which is spread over a flat surface. For a single surong, three different types of blocks are pre-designed, namely the head, the body, and the foot. The blocks are immersed in wax and pressed onto the relevant parts of the cloth, whereby the head block will be pressed on the center part of the cloth, the foot block on the boundaries of the cloth, while the body block on the rest of the cloth. The parts of the cloth that have already been imprinted by the wax will reveal the remaining design of the batik, which will undergo the same process of coloring, boiling, cracking, and wax removal. Pertama sekali, kita mengecok atas kain putih. Maksudnya kain putih ini, kita buat corak. Kita cok dengan lilin, kita buat corak atas kain putih ini. Yang pertama-tama sekali, kita cok kaki, lepas tu kepala, lepas tu badang. Mana kita kena tahu mana, mana tempat mulanya, mana bagian-bagian satu, satu helai kain batik ni. Sekarang ni apabila dah kita dah cok atas satu helai kain ni, proses seterusnya kita nak mencelup kala. This process is repeated when a multicolored effect is desired. For polychrome patterns, the process of waxing and soaking is repeated and will continue until the required number of colors has been obtained. This is done whenever a new pattern is traced by wax and for the removal of excess wax and color. Dan proses seterusnya apabila dah kain ni kita celup warna kita perlu jemur dulu sehingga kering. Ha, kalau basah tak lekat dia ni. Ha, sekarang ni apabila dah kering kita cap sekali lagi. Ha ni contoh kain yang dah celup warna biru. Ha mana warna kuning tu kekal. Yang yang tak kena semua jadi hitam. Ha 
ia ada yang melalui proses pematah liling. Ha, mana kita patahnya. Sebab yang pertama, kuasa yang pertama tu, asalkan ini warna putih, ha, sebab kita patahkan warna, warna liling ni, lepas ni kita akan celup warna merah. Ha, warna, yang, warna yang akhir sekali. Warna, warna merah akan masuk ke liling yang patah ni. Lepas dah kita celup warna merah, akhir sekali kita rebus. Rebus untuk tanggalkan liling pada kain ni. Kita rebus dengan air panas. Satu kawah tu, Uh, air panas biasa satu kawah lagi air yang bercampur dengan soda uh, kita masak dan jadi, jadi dua kali rebus satu helai kain ini dan yang tinggal hanyalah corok pada kain ini uh. uh, sekarang ni bila dah kita basuh ah uh, jemur kita, kita boleh pasarkan batik is also popularly worn by the Peranakan, or straits-born Chinese women folk, referred to as the Nonyas in the Malaysian state of Malacca. The Baba Nyonya, or Peranakan Chinese, the name means straits-born, and their ancestors go back to the 15th century. It is through the intermarriages between Chinese traders and settlers with the Javanese, Sumatran, and local women that the Baba Nyonya heritage is born. More often than not, they adopt the Malay way of life, and this meant also adorning Malay clothing. A loose batik sorong, or sheath, is commonly worn over a kabaya blouse. The batik sorong is held in place by a metal or silver belt, which is an ornament in itself. The batik they wore were sarongs dyed in the batik method, bearing brightly colored flower motifs. The widespread usage of batik by the Peranakan meant that there is no longer a Malay stereotypical dominance over batik. Over the years, batik has developed to be a Malaysian identity with a multiracial and multi-ethnic acceptance, as opposed to being strictly linked to only Malays. Today, batik is worn by Malaysians from all ethnic groups and even the young are attracted to the modern contemporary batik designs widely available in the market. Batik is so firmly entrenched in our Malaysian culture that it has become our official national attire for formal occasions. Batik has long been worn as fashion wear. Way back in history, it's written and captured on photographs that maidens wore colorful sarongs with matching kabayas, while the older women used to wear a long batik cloth apparel called baju panjang or baju kurung. We even saw menfolk using batik sarongs and batiks as headgear. Batik has managed to evolve throughout the century into becoming a contemporary fashion icon and has gained widespread admiration from fashion designers worldwide. International fashion designers who love the characteristics of batik have generated them into haute couture, casual wear, evening wear, and even to avant-garde wedding gowns. Even in present-day Europe and the USA, contemporary batik fashion is fast becoming popular. Today, batik is deemed as essential attire of everyday life. Age-old motifs are combined with very modern ideas to create Batik Malaysia, what it is today. As it bears all the colors of the world. While batik can be a prized gift, it can also be worn on a casual basis. When assembled with the kabaya, it becomes an elegant yet traditional fashion wear, suitable for both formal and informal banquets. Batik does not necessarily need to be worn the traditional way, as the possibilities of enhancing and creating them into contemporary pieces are endless, be it modern dresses, or it can even be manufactured into a household item such as wall hangings, kaftans,
cushions. Tablecloths, and the list goes on. Fashion shows put together bearing the Batek themes are just as awe-inspiring as any international renowned fashion show. Malaysian Batek is, is art to wear um, because it's all one of a kind and they are like my art pieces and wearable. I think we are a class of our own because if you compare the, in this region, I think Indonesia is the biggest manufacturer of batik. But how do, you, how, how do you identify Malaysian and Indonesian batik? It's our design and our colors. And uh, we are very contemporary. We, are, we follow trends, we follow fashion. The late Datin Paduka Seri Endon Mahmud, late wife of Malaysia's fifth prime minister, Datuk Seri Abdullah Badawi, has made batik into a champion cause. She saw the potential in batik and poured her efforts into promoting batik so that it would be more popular worn nationwide. And if possible, throughout the world. But changes had to occur to ensure that the industry would not fade away into oblivion and die a natural death. The emphasis of change was on the production and marketing aspects of the industry. As for the waning interest of the local people, it has to be continually reinforced that Batek is an inherent part of Malaysian identity and personality. Yayasan Budi Panyayaya Malaysia is the main organizing body that has been put to task to implement her dream. Its activities include an annual Batek Week extravaganza and also the establishment of the Piala Seri Endon Batek Design Competition to provide a platform and exposure for all potential batik designers. It is with the hope to improve the overall design and quality of the Malaysian batik. Setelahnya, uh, pemegian uh, arwah Su Indon sekarang ni, so batik sekarang diambil oleh uh, anaknya sendiri, uh, Puan Nuri uh, dengan Dat Datuk Lela, so dengan adanya galeri butik juga, dia orang telah uh, menubuhkan satu butik, galeri Su Indon, yang menempatkan semua pembunuhan-pembunuhan batik daripada tahun pertama hingga tahun sekarang ini. So, um, batik uh, dengan ada buat butik ini satu platform yang bagus, masyarakat boleh tengok batik apa yang trend terkini, macam uh, setiap hari Kamis pun uh, kita punya kerajaan telah, uh, telah menggalakkan uh, memakai batik. Ini pun satu um, peluang kepada pengusaha-pengusaha batik untuk membuat batik dengan lebih banyak lagi dan saya rasa macam golongan VVIP pun lebih baik selalu memakai batik um, dalam acara-acara macam dia orang pergi function ke dia orang pergi mana-mana event uh, pakailah batik apa yang saya tengok sekarang banyaklah golongan VIP memakai batik so salah satu trend macam satu ikutan bila masyarakat tengok ah uh, ini VIP ni pakai batik ni ni dia orang pun nak ikut nak pakai batik a 1985 where there is an inflation in Malaysia so the price of batik drops and then you can see that the batik making in Malaysia tends to drop in terms of production and then you can see the rise again in batik after the late uh, Datin Sri Endon introduced the Piala Sri Endon so you can see the revival of batik making in Malaysia and uh, and as it is now there is uh, more experimentation in terms of product batik making where they mix blend techniques not only confined to janting but also the use of other medium that can transfer wax onto the fabrics. Pun Yai Young orchestrated the first international class event bearing the theme, the business of batik that attracted Batek aficionados, textile enthusiasts, buyers, and sellers from all over the world. What we can do, we can develop the, the industry, you know, 
We, we have to prepare our artisans. We have to prepare our uh, people in the industry better to cope with the world market. I think uh, we should always stress on good craftsmanship, delivery and volume. And I think what we are lacking is still in this department here. On January 31st, 2008, Datuk Seri Utama Dr. Rais Yatin, our former Minister of Culture, Arts and Heritage, launched program Pengunahan Piawayan Batik Malaysia under the flagship of the Ministry of Unity, Culture, Arts and Heritage to further promote Malaysian batik to the whole world. Batik has become a national symbol among tourists and popularly dubbed as tourist batik. It is acquired not as just a reminder of their stay in tropical Malaysia, but as rare souvenirs for those back home. For those whom have had the pleasure of attempting batik tulis, it serves as a reminder of an ecstatic self-expression that they have had the pleasure to personally experience. Batik, batik as an art, we have it in India too. This is my first time in Malaysia and uh, well honestly I was a little surprised when I saw batik because ours is, my concept of batik in India is very different from what I've seen here. Probably it's more, um, it's more colourful. There we only have I believe one background colour and then you do another colour on it traditionally and I'm sure things have changed here. They, they said uh, on Thursdays, uh, government employees are supposed to be wearing batik so that you promote and keep the art and tradition alive. Uh, that I found very interesting because we have never done anything like that in India to preserve uh, traditional art. So even if it's a rule, I think that's one of the rules I really like, that you're supposed to be wearing batiks on Thursdays. We are small in the, this industry. So um, if I have my way, you know, we have to develop the the the, uh, the business here to cope with the Malaysian market first because um, I, f I feel if we promote the use of batik locally I think we have a better market here because we can wear batik all year round whereas for the world we have we have fashion we have we have seasons and batik is in fashion this year it might not be for the next 10 years I think we have to have this joint where fashion designers and textile designers work together. If Malaysian batik makers thinking of introducing our batik to overseas, we need to, first of all, to study the culture there, the kind of design, the kind of climate there, the kind of colours that they use over there. So if we, Malaysian batik, want to export there, we cannot impose our values to them. We cannot impose our material, we cannot impose our design to them. We need to make a study over there, then only we can redesign our batik that can fit in for that particular market. The evolution of batik creations throughout the years has been revolutionary, but there is still fear that it may lose the aura linked with the entire history of the batik making process, in particular, the hand-drawn method of batik making. Batik must always be preserved and maintained throughout time even though there is available technological advancement, as its survival is the crux to uphold our beloved tradition. Pada saya batik mm, akan pergi lebih jauh lagi ke arah global. Uh, pastikan kualiti batik itu bermutu dari segi jahitan, dari segi mutu desain, dan selalulah membuat uh, macam fa fashion show keluar negara, pertandingan. Kerap selalu ada aktiviti batik. Saya rasa batik boleh pergi lebih jauh lagi. Tepat saya tu cuma nak nak suruh jagalah kualiti batik kita uh, supaya mutu dia akan terus lekat di hati para peminat batik tu aja. I feel the only way, the only way to keep this industry alive is to make it uh, known, you know, and and to entice younger generation to be in the industry. This industry needs talented uh, craftsmen and um, 
And then unless we, we get the young to come in, this is a dying art. It is comforting to see that the movement known as Malaysian Batik, crafted for the world, launched in 2003, has instigated renewed interest in the art of batik making. With the right support from various government organizations, batik artisans in Malaysia can now continue their love and passion for the art, knowing that there are avenues for growth in the Malaysian batik industry.